I'm pleased to introduce you our next speaker, who is uh, Paul Preddy. He's from Ireland. He's a barrister in Dublin and is also a, a candidate for a PhD in Oxford at Balliol College. John Finnis is his uh, supervisor. And Paul uh, also uh, is also a, um, a co-author of a book uh, whose title is Psychiatry and the Law. And he will present us a paper uh, entitled Just Judging. Please. Thank you. Mm. Um, thank you very much. It's a great honor to have been um, invited to this workshop, and I'm very grateful to, um, to the department here for this wonderful occasion. Is the, yeah, for, for this uh, wonderful occasion. So I just want to say a sincere thanks. Um, the topic of my, of my paper, Just Judging, um, has, there's a number of reasons for that title. The first reason was because when I was asked for a title a number of weeks ago, uh, and I didn't know what I was going to be talking about, it seemed to give the greatest scope possible um, for what I might eventually say. So there's an ambiguity there. Now I can look back and say, actually, it was a very clever, uh, deliberate choice of title that, in fact, was meant to indicate uh, the theme of my paper, which is looking at the nature of adjudication in light of this discussion that I think started this morning about the nature of law and these positivist natural law accounts. I mean, I should say to begin that um, I'm approaching this, I suppose, on the basis of this morning's discussion as a positivist and as a natural lawyer. I am both equally, uh, in, in, it seems, in equal measure. But my interest in the topic um, there was also mention this morning, I think, by, by Jordi and Giovanni of, of realism and critical realism and skeptical accounts of law. And my interest in adjudication was sparked by my uh, experience or my um, interest with critical legal realist thinkers. Um, when I was studying in America, all of my lecturers effectively were of this critical legal realism school. Um, Duncan Kennedy, David Kennedy, Mark Tushnet, um, Alan Hutchinson, Ran Herschel. I was getting it in every subject. Private law, critical legal studies. International law, through critical legal studies. And so it did uh, obviously had made an inches, this sort of very political account. And it's, it's all politics or it's all morality and, and so on. Seemed to dovetail with certain views of the practical lawyer. The idea that, oh, I can't believe I've got that judge and not that judge. Now the law is going to be this and the law won't be that. And it seems to speak to that experience. But on the other hand, um, it didn't seem to speak to the experience of why the lawyer thought it was worthwhile uh, going to a courtroom and resolving things in this way. Why we had this whole institution in the first place why it was valuable, if it only boiled down to, I've got the wrong judge, um, and it's just, just politics. So it seemed to miss something. And I'm, one of the attempts in this paper is to sort of see is there a way of, of, of a better account of, of adjudication. So just to start, I, I define, let's just say stipulatively, just for the purpose of argument, moral reasoning as reasoning by moral agents for the purposes of determining what one should do, grounded in that this reasoning is grounded in or it invokes non-posited practical reasons. So we called norms earlier on or moral norms. And judicial reasoning is reasoning employed by judges for the purposes of determining legal cases that is grounded in or invokes legal reasons. And I'm deliberately not specifying anything further than that. So there's a lot of discussion about how these two types of reasoning relate. And I list a few possible crude sort of th theses. You could say, A, moral reasoning is not necessary for judicial reasoning. It's external to it, because judicial reasoning is purely a matter of calculation, demonstration. You just apply, and it's a sort of deductive reasoning. Or you could say moral reasoning is necessary. It, it is required, but it's external. It's not to do with um, legal reasons, it's something bolted on to judicial reasoning. 
moral reasoning is not necessary for judicial reasoning, but will typically be made internal to it by some kind of formal incorporation, some sort of legal norm that allows the judge to now treat as a legal reason what otherwise would have been a moral reason. I'm going to skip D just for the moment. Um, e, judicial reasoning is ultimately nothing more than moral reasoning, which again is sort of a crude position, maybe a summary of the realist claim. And then an even more extreme, uh, judicial reasoning is ultimately nothing more than moral reasoning, and moral reasoning itself is nothing more than the non-directive rationalization of prior sub-rational or irrational causes of your behavior, causes of your decision-making. It itself is some kind of illusion. And I'm, so I think A and F are the two extremes here, often I think straw man arguments or foils um, in this. You could say rationalistic deductivism, the one extreme, formalism, and at the other extreme, this irrational sort of decisionism. <coughs> and I'm suggesting a, a sort of a D, which obviously gets more favorable uh, and expansive treatment. Um, moral, uh, moral reasoning is both necessary and internal to judicial reasoning. But the use of non posited these moral normative propositions in judicial reasoning, is limited by recognition of the moral requirement that such use does not defeat or frustrate the very point of recognizing as authoritative for judicial reasoning those posited normative propositions, the institutionalized system of posited uh, legal reasons, normative propositions. So I'm trying to argue for an understanding of morality and adjudication that doesn't see it as something added on to law, some kind of external add-on, uh, but as something that um, we can understand by reflecting on the practice of adjudication, the purpose of adjudication. So just before that, so just to say two things in any theory about adjudication, I think it seems to me that they necessarily uh, rely upon or presuppose some theory of law. So in other words, a theory of adjudication will have a certain understanding of what a law is, and hence the criteria for legal validity, and hence the defining characteristics of law and legal authority, and hence, I think, the purpose of law itself and its place in our general practical reasoning. And as a result of this, secondly, it seems that every theory of adjudication will equally presuppose and rely upon some understanding of practical reasoning itself and the very nature of practical decision-making. So it seems that to have a sound understanding of adjudication, one will ultimately first have to have a sound understanding of, of nature of law and the nature of practical reasoning. Now, I wish I was in a position to give you a fully worked out <laughs> theory of, of adjudication here. I'm not at all, as befits the um, youngest member of this uh, intergenerational panel from Oxford. I'm giving you the um, rawest um, propositions still in working, being worked out, and I hope to learn more about this topic from the discussion than you will probably learn from me. So with those caveats, a few, a few thoughts. Adjudication and justification, what's happening in adjudication? So I say to give a justification is to give a reason for a decision that invokes a normative principle. So it's this inv invocation of a normative principle which distinguishes a justification from simply a causal explanation or a mere reporting of someone's uh, motivation, subjective motivation. And we can view such a principle as a type of universal rule because to accept it or to be convinced by the ju my justification, the, w the justification I offer, is to accept that the reasons for my decision, the decision I'm justifying, are also, at least presumptively, good reasons for anyone else, relevantly like me, faced with a relevantly similar situation of choice. So in other words, to accept my justification is to accept the truth and the relevance of the universal rule to which I'm appealing and the correctness of its application or its significance for my choice. So to justify, to give a justification, is to engage in practical reasoning, and it is to make an argument, a justificatory argument. And I think all justification, in that sense, only occurs as a response to a question in a, in a discursive context. So the question can be posed by someone else, or it can be, you can be asking yourself in a sort of deliberation. But it's essentially of the form, why do X? Why did you do X? Why should you do X? Why do X? And until that question is actually posed, 
formulated, one cannot talk of a justification in response to that. So I suggest that norm applying institutions of law, courts, judges, exist or are created as a reasonable response to the rational necessity, not any other kind of necessity, it's a rational necessity because of the circumstances of, let's say, disagreement, uncertainty, dissent, of, so there's a necessity for the authoritative application of that set of universal practical propositions which constitute a legal system. And to say that decision A is an application of rule X is simply to say that A is justified by rule X. So that's the link, I think, between rule application and the work of justification. So adjudication or judicial reasoning is concerned then with determining in response and with regard to a particular question, particular concern, the legal truth of the matter, i.e. the decision justified according to law. And I think we can call that the formal purpose of adjudication. So that's, that's formally, that's the, the form in which judicial reasoning takes place. But it is because of the intelligible desirability as a matter of justice, as a matter of moral justice, of having a reasonable and effective coordination in our social lives and the further recognition of the unique suitability for this task of a system of government of ordering which has the features and ideals of law, that the formal purpose of adjudication can be rationally related to a final purpose, its justifying purpose, which I think is ultimately the determining of what is just. Now, what, what I mean by that is, in sort of an Aristotelian sense, I mean determining what, in the circumstances of the case, is due to whom, is truly due to whom. So the formal question you know, is what decision is justified by law. The final question ultimately you're trying to achieve is what is owed to whom? What is owed to whom in this situation? Now, one's due will in some respects be adequately determined by morality, some respects, but in many respects, perhaps most, will be underdetermined. Morality will underdetermine what we are due. And it's because of this, and precisely in such circumstances, that the determinatio, or the uh, specification, the, the choice of a positive legal solution, positive legal proposition, becomes relevant, comes into play, has its justifying role as a reasonable and effective response to the coordination problems created by this underdeterminacy of what I call, following uh, Professor Finnis, the universal requirements of practical reasonableness or morality, as well as the problems created by those who are mistaken about these requirements or are indifferent to them or are uh, actively antagonistic to them. So this final purpose of adjudication, the determination of what is just, what is due to whom, must also be understood in light of the further purposes of the legal system to which this judicial act of determination is also ordered instrumentally as a means to an end. So the task of determining what is just, the judicial task, can also be rightly elaborated with regard to these further purposes as determining what is just according to law, where law here is understood in its central case, the case that makes sense of it as a distinct kind of social practice, as being actually orientated towards the common good of the community for which it is the law, and not in any secondary, derivative, deviant sense, whatever happens to be enforced as law around here. Because obviously, that link, the rationality of that link between the formal purpose of a judge, the final purpose of adjudication, is lost. That rationality of that link can be broken in situations where the domain of legal reasons um, is so unjust, or in this circumstance is so unjust, um, that it is not actually orientated or in the service of the common good. And so, insofar as that responsiveness breaks down, the, the rationality of the link between the formal purpose and this final purpose of adjudication will be lost. And that's a possibility which, of course, any sound theory of law and adjudication should openly acknowledge as, as a possibility, and in many cases uh, a reality. So just on page, the next, on page five, I just, to recap, list the different purposes I've identified. Uh, the formal purpose, authoritative application of legal rules, and that's done by determining legal claims, you could say, or you can also say answering legal questions, whatever way you want to conceptualize that task. 
with the proximate final purpose that they explain the, the purpose that makes sense of this, determining what is just, and that itself is understood and is orientated in light of the purposes of the legal system, which I've said one here, final um, mm. I've listed here has also been further final purposes of adjudication, ending ultimately in promotion of the common good that makes sense of why we're, we're doing this in the first place. So then, the role of justification then in, and, and legal argumentation, given that adjudication is, is this sort of justificatory activity. So in, I say in legal argumentation, the universal normative principle which grounds the, the legal justification is a legal proposition. So the legal proposition plays that role that a, a general norm plays in general justification, general moral justification. And every litigated case begins and ends with the assertion of a formal justificatory argument because the claim or charge that initiates a case is presented as a justification for a remedy or a verdict which is sought. And the decision that ultimately determines the case is authoritative, has legal authority, creates the obligations that it does, because and only insofar as it is asserted as being justified by the law. Typically, and for many you know, good reasons, this assertion of that the, the decision the judge gives is authoritative because it is justified by law is expressly communicated in a judicial opinion, written or oral, which articulates as an actual justification for the decision, makes a legal argument. And in, so both the initiating claim and in this ultimate determining decision, the justifying principle being appealed to is asserted as a valid legal proposition of the legal system. And that's important. It's not asserted as some moral uh, proposition that has nothing to do with the legal system that's just brought in. The, the legal argument will depend on being a valid legal proposition as being the ultimate um, justifying norm. Now, as in the case with other arguments, a distinction can be drawn between validity and, on the one hand, the deductive validity, the logic of the um, conclusion following validly from the premises, and on the other hand, the cogency or the soundness of the argument, which goes to the truth or the acceptability of the premises. And the same distinction is often drawn in legal argument between the terms internal justification, to refer to that concern with the validity of the reasoning, and external justification, to refer to the soundness of the premises. So this is not anything, I think, um, original or, or too controversial. So I'll just set out there the basic, I call it legal, syllogism, but obviously not legal syllogism, um, which uh, you have a legal proposition, you have a factual proposition, legal conclusion, and internal justification is concerned with showing that that is a valid argument. But ultimately, and you can expand that, and I have a sort of expanded version then when you discover there's, there's other steps to it, interpretive premise or a classification premise, and setting it out in that form uh, is, has a number of benefits. One is that it shows the role of a general universal rule in legal argument, that legal argument does uh, operate in a formal sense by appealing to a universal rule, and that speaks to uh, concerns with impartiality of law, with the, um, the requirement of equal treatment of like cases and so on, and that is recognized in the fact that a justified legal argument appeals to a general rule. It doesn't just um, issue a specific decree. It's a, considered to be an application of, of a general rule. But it also reveals the, um, the limits of such demonstrative reasoning, such deductive forms, because obviously as soon as a question is, uh, uh, is raised about the soundness or the truth of any of these premises, any of these steps, internal justification must uh, give way to a more substantive external justificatory argument. And regarding such argument, I suppose just two general points, again, nothing I think too, um, too novel. First is that I think how one understands these external justificatory arguments, the arguments you use to support your legal premise, your interpretive claim, your factual, uh, your classification, and so on, that how you understand those arguments will greatly be determined by your prior conception of practical reasoning in general, as I suggested at the start. So a skeptical 
or a non-cognitivist view of practical reason and practical truth will, I think, translate into a sceptical account of the rationality of these kind of external justificatory legal arguments. Um, like any reductivist or deterministic account of human reason and choice, it will result in a critique of the very idea of justification that downplays the rational guidance that could possibly offer, be offered by general principles or universal rules and instead emphasises the causative role of non-intellectual factors. And this is a theme, obviously, in a lot of critical realist literature. By contrast, a highly rationalistic account of practical reasoning that conflates demonstration and the practice of deliberation will result in that characterization of legal argument as calculative or simply deductive that I mentioned at the start. And these accounts are usually offered, I think, as I said, as straw men for later demolition. But insofar as they are even implicitly offered as the standard against which law should be measured, and then as a matter of regret and realism found wanting, they are also to be challenged. So I think it should be no surprise that debates over legal indeterminacy often appear quite interminable as long as they remain at the level of analysis or just description of judicial practice, rather than taking a step back to look at the very account of practical reasoning which informs these competing positions. Secondly, if, if external justification is to make sense as judicial reasoning, uh, I think one needs to accept the difference between, but the equal rationality of this demonstrative type of reasoning and also deliberative modes of reasoning. And I think one mistakenly reduces legal justificatory argument to demonstration if one adopts the following, implicitly or expressly, as a criterion of correctness in legal justification. You could, you could call it the uh, uniqueness condition or... Um, um, one writer, uh, Burton, has, has called it the uh, determinacy condition, which is decision A is justified by X in circumstances C if and only if A is the only decision justified by X in C. And acceptance of this condition uh, as the only way that external argument should justify, external justification should justify its outcomes, I think ultimately dooms jurisprudence of legal argument and judicial reasoning to a choice between those two equally undesirable and I think unreasonable alternatives that I've set out, the, the indeterminacy of a rational decisionism or the absolute determinism of rationalistic deductivism, these two extremes. And that's caused, I think, by this idea, implicit or explicit, that for justification in law to be true, to be um, valid, you have to have this extra condition. And then by proving that that condition isn't satisfied, you somehow prove that the justification isn't actually one based in law or isn't actually rational, but is in some re respects influenced by some other outside um, surreptitious cause. Now, the sorry, the second then point about, uh, is the limits of external argument. Because in theory, there's never a point at which no further question can be raised concerning the premise of an argument of internal or external justification. In theory, each question, in principle, demands a new chain of justificatory answering argument. And I think this is sometimes another reason that's offered for um, problems in judicial reasoning, that every point is contestable. But I think there should, however, be recognized a point at which no further relevant questions can be asked, even if questions can always be asked, no further relevant questions can be asked, and it's this limit which forms the horizon, I think, for all reasonable or truth-seeking or justified inquiry and judgment, and is the ultimate measure of correctness and objectivity in human knowing. When there is on a topic before you make a judgment, no, no more relevant questions to be considered. That's the ideal, I think, horizon. Now, moreover, given the requirement of justice that legal solutions be not only reasonable but effective, and that there is effective justice is not just a, a separate criterion from justice, it's a requirement of justice, one should also recognize a point at which no further questions can reasonably be asked. So judicial deliberation must come to an end, and a determination must be made if um, the legal system is to succeed in, in the goods it's trying to achieve. So in practice, of course, considerations of time, of cost, of um, strategy in, in legal argument 
and an appreciation, whether consciously acknowledged if not, or not, of the limits of your legal audience's conceptions of what is a plausible or an acceptable question or challenge to make in a given context. These will all reasonably, I think, narrow the range of issues that parties or judges themselves will judge reasonable to raise for deliberation and then determination. And so before any particular argument of external justification is formulated or asserted, a practical judgment will already have been made by the party or the judge who is going to give that argument as to the reasonableness of even making or of responding to a demand for such an external justification. But that's different from saying, and this does not necessarily mean, however, that whenever an argument of external justification is not demanded or not offered by participants in a legal argument, that these omissions are somehow the result of a practical deliberation and a judgment on their part. In other words, that every theoretical or practical principle which is potentially present in a rational justificatory reconstruction of our decisions might conceivably be contested. The fact that it might conceivably be contested does not mean that when something is not actually or expressly contested in an argument, in a discourse, this is because it has been somehow implicitly contested and then implicitly determined. And I think it's this notion of a hidden or an implicit or unintentional act of justification carried out in the absence of any actual or reasonable challenge or question that results in this all-encompassing notion of interpretation, which leads some to conclude, I, I think unhelpfully, things like every application of a rule is an interpretation of the rule, or every act of understanding is an act of interpretation. So th there are just two general points about, about um, external uh, justification. The need to distinguish between deliberation and um, demonstration, and the rationality of deliberation as a form of, of decision-making, as a form of judgment, and also this idea that there are just because everything is contestable um, doesn't mean that when a, a certain argument uh, takes place in which not every premise, because it's impossible in th that every single potentially contestable premise is considered, that means that somehow hidden decisions or judgments have been made. So propositions then justified according to law. So this is then the final, um, just to focus on the legal premise, I, I set out the different premises that are potentially challenged in a, in a legal argument. And the factual premise is a matter of general empirical reasoning. Um, and I just want to look at justifying the legal premise of a, of a formal legal argument. And I say, as a sort of bold statement here, a law is a universal practical proposition which is conceived in the reason of the ruler and communicated to the reason of the ruled so that the latter will treat that proposition, at least presumptively, as a reason for action. And how do I justify that and so on? Well, obviously that is a, where I suggest that you need to have a sound understanding of what law is before you can make progress um, on a theory of adjudication. And the claim there is that the primary reality of a law is as that form, as a practical proposition, as a reason for us to consider in our reasoning. And in a legal system, that it, there's a communicative element. It's this reason, practical reason, communicated to another for a purpose. And the use of legislative institutions to publicly communicate these authoritative practical propositions is a defining feature of the type of institutional normative system that is properly called, in its central case, a legal system. And so we should distinguish talk of the law as a practical proposition, as a reason for action, from talk of the law as these authoritative communications or texts um, used to communicate the, these practical reasons. So then I'd suggest, and this is where I'm sort of speculative in the next few pages, I'm just trying to get my own thoughts together on this, and I appreciate ideas on trying to formulate this more correctly, but I'm suggesting an act of law creating, the act of positing law, comprises first, then, the adoption of a practical proposal to promote a particular pattern of a future social order or of some aspect of such an order. So to provide a just solution uh, to a coordination problem. That's a proposal is adopted in the, in the deliberation of, of the lawgiver. 
And then second, as a means to realizing that proposal, that, that envisaged order, there's the deliberate articulation, the authoritative utterance of a meaning statement, a text, S, let's say, which utterance, the utterance of S, is intended both to communicate and make valid for the norm users of that legal system, the legal proposition N. So there's a number of parts here. So I'm saying that the, the meaning statement, the text S, often referred to as legal material, legal text, and you have the semantic meaning of S, this communication, which is determined by the semantic content of S and its semantic context of its utterance. And then you have what's co called by some the pragmatically enriched semantic meaning, or what's actually asserted, the content of that statement. And uh, I have a quote just from a um, philosopher of language here, Scott Soames, who puts it this way, semantic meaning is not what faithful interpreters should be looking for, since even when it is identified, it may fail to determine the text's content, the asserted meaning. That content, which encompasses everything conveyed or asserted by the text, often includes information that goes well beyond the semantic contents of the sentences involved. Because typically an agent produces a sentence in a context with one, a communicative goal and topic, to a record of what has been supposed or established up till then, and third, assumptions about the beliefs and intentions of the participants. And I think that can be usefully incorporated into the legal context. So we could say that the pragmatic context relevant for adjudication is that context created by the norms, the postulates, the presumptions, the techniques, which we identify as the formal features of the legal system and the rule of law, its structuring ideals, uh, or those requirements of justice which, which structure how it works, which determine and regulate the nature and function of legal systems institutions. They provide the pragmatic context for legal communication. So um, there's an analogy here with Grice's discussion of conversational maxims. So Grice sa said that a, a conversation is a cooperative exchange of information. And as a result of that, there will be certain norms for that rational and efficient achievement of the purpose of, of that kind of cooperative exchange of information. And so again, if you look at the legal context, obviously there are differences, um, and I'll talk about one in a moment, but we could say that the form of communication of the legislator to, the, to those for whom the norms are uh, relevant is a communication with a, which also has a goal. And I'd, I'm suggesting that the goal is to make equally efficacious in the reasoning, the practical reasoning of all the norm users, present and public, private, present and future, private and public, or institutional users like courts and other le future legislatures, those universal propositions of practical reason which they intend, together with the standing general requirements of practical reasonableness, as authoritative solutions to the community's coordination problems. That's what, they're, that's the, that's what this communication is trying to achieve. And that's, it's in light of that goal that the, the norm creator um, forms the particular text to communicate their intention. So I think it's useful at this point to distinguish two questions. Uh, it's a distinction made by Larry Alexander um, that should be addressed by a theory of legal interpretation. And he says the first question concerns the intention of the lawmaking authorities, the communicators, those communicating this, this law, their intention is a matter of semantics and pr pragmatics, the role of that intention in determining the correct meaning of the utterances that they make, the, the, the meaning statements that they make. That's one issue. And the second question concerns the authority which we should give as a matter of law to that meaning, that meaning that we've determined by reference to the lawmaker's intentions. This second question is really a matter, he says, of political morality. What role should the intention of the lawmaker have uh, what authority should that have for future interpreters? But the first question, uh, what's the role of the intention of the lawmaker for the meaning of what they've said, is really a matter for the philosophy of language. Though I think the context, the content of the pragmatic context which you will use to try and understand that asserted content, that pragmatic context will be informed by our understanding of what it is to be a legal system and what it is, the, what is the, the dual context in which the utterance takes place.
So then, finally, I think that the, that asserted meaning then of the lawmakers should be distinguished again from the judgment as to the intrasystemic significance of that legal proposition which they intend by their, their utterance of S, because the legal significance of it will be determined by its interaction with the other valid norms, existing valid norms of the system. Um, and I have some quotes here trying to um, align this with a, a thought expressed by Professor Finnis, just the middle quote there, the components of a legal system as a set of rules and other standards must be understood not as the statements found in the text of constitutions, statutes and judgments, or judicial orders, but as the propositions which are true as a matter of law by reason A, of the authoritative utterance of those statements, taken with B, the bearing on those utterances and statements, and on the propositions those utterances were intended to make valid law, of the legal system's other already valid propositions. So we, we need to bear this distinction in mind because every legal system will have a finite amount of text, positive text, and a finite number of linguistic units of semantic meaning uh, which make up that text. But by contrast, understood as a set of valid legal propositions, it's made up of an indefinite number of such normative propositions because, um, as another quote from there, there are as many true propositions of law as there are legally answerable questions that might be raised about the subject matter. So I think it can now be appreciated that the term law can be used by judges and lawyers to refer to at least three different objects. They can be talking about the authoritatively uttered texts. They can be talking about the posited legal propositions that are asserted and made valid by those texts. Uh, they can be talking about the set of all valid legal propositions, posited and non-posited. And this is a distinction that matters because what... It goes to what we mean when we say that the judge's job is to um, see whether a proposition is justified according to law. So what's the law we're, we're talking about? And just, I've recapped there the, the three possible um, things I've distinguished. The semantic meaning of the legal texts, the asserted meaning of the legal texts, and then the juridical relevance of what has been asserted by that text, which needs to take into account the rest of the norms uh, and propositions of the system. And just on the asserted meaning there in the middle one, I flesh out a bit the possible things that could um, add to the pragmatic context that help us to understand the asserted meaning. And um, there's three elements, I think, uh, when one looks at the beliefs and intentions of the person making the assertion you can attribute the beliefs and intentions which should be attributed to all legislators qua legislators. And that goes to the heart of your understanding of what a legal system is. So that's a sort of jurisprudential uh, question. And then there's the beliefs and intentions which should be attributed to all legislators as legislators of the legal system you're operating in. And that will depend on what are the effective or valid canons of interpretation and so on. And they can change over time and different um, legal systems will have different understandings depending on maybe how their laws are drafted and so on. And then there's the third set, the actual beliefs and intentions of the legislators who actually uttered the, um, the text that you're, you're trying to uh, interpret. And the role that those different intentions have, there's different questions to be answered about those. It's not one answer for each of those. Uh, I'm not giving an answer necessarily to that. I'm just trying to distinguish the different uh, intentions that are present. So just to, to, to conclude um, with uh, just two, a few quick points about that task then of what's the criteria of correctness when you are making an external justificatory argument for why you're using this legal proposition and not that legal proposition as the um, first term of your legal argument as the first term of your formal argument that is determining a case or making a legal claim. How, when you justify, when you're asked to justify why that legal rule and not another legal rule. And again, not too originally, I think that that form of justification operates on two dimensions. And one dimension will comprise posited, those authoritatively uttered legal texts or legal um, statements. They mightn't be texts. Uh, well, they're texts in this broad sense of 
what has been positively uttered. And the second dimension comprises the non-positive general principles of practical reason. Um, the requirements, I think, of practical reasonableness or the principles derived from those requirements. The very requirements, remember, which shape and determine why we would have the institution of law in the first place, which impacts on the form and the purpose of adjudication, as I, as I mentioned earlier on. And it has these two dimensions, because first, the reasonableness of treating the fact that a text is the product of a past act of legal positing, that you treat that as a sufficient, although defeasible, reason to consider that the proposition which it asserts has some juridical relevance now to your, your justificatory argument, the reasonableness of that can only be established by reference to these non-positive principles of practical reasoning. And likewise, the content, I'm suggesting, of such texts can only be understood in light of the pragmatic context of their utterance. It's not the semantic context, but the full pragmatically enriched context of their utterance, which gives you what was asserted. And that pragmatic context itself, as I've suggested, is partly determined by reference to these non-positive principles of practical reasoning, because it partly depends on our idea of why the assertion has been made, why there is a lawgiver, why we are listening to the lawgiver, and so on. And since these non-positive principles are therefore a necessary and constituent element in any legal argument, which invokes positive legal rules, it has to play these, the two roles I've suggested there. There's no, I think, good reason to consider them as somehow non-legal or extra-legal or less legal than the positive legal propositions. And again, this insight has consequences for what we, can, what we should mean when we talk about judges deciding and justifying according to law. And second, I think judicial reasoning, the, the, the interrelation between these two dimensions of the positive and the non-positive, because judicial reasoning as to the validity or the juridical relevance of the purported legal propositions, not just about their asserted meaning, but their actual relevance now in the whole system, is itself guided by non-positive principles in a number of different ways. First, there's the moral obligation that they impose on judges not to deliberately frustrate the proper functioning of the techniques and postulates which make a legal system what it is. And this is the idea that Professor Finn has mentioned, I, I suppose, that it's, there's a nat natural law theory requires legal positivity. It defends legal positivity. It sees the value of legal positivity. So it, it's, and it's going to want to defend that all, even in, in judicial reasoning, of course in judicial reasoning. So it's the non-positive principle of fairness. There's a quote here, for, again, from Professor Finnis. That it's this non-positive principle of fairness that ultimately drives the law towards the artificial, the techne rationality of laying down and then following a set of positive norms, identifiable as far as possible simply by their source, and applied so far as possible according to their publicly stipulated meaning, which I've tried to distinguish semantic and asserted, but they are effectively the publicly stipulated meaning, itself elucidated with as little as possible, as little as possible, appeal to considerations which, because not controlled by facts about sources, are inherently likely to be applied, appealed to differently by different judges. So that's the first way it does. There's a moral duty to try and stick to the positive materials and to give them authority. But also, um, that's only as far as possible. It can't, it can't be done exclusively. And so secondly, there's the way non-positive principles must be, are implicitly and explicitly invoked in the deliberative reasoning necessary for judgments as to the legal validity or the juridical relevance of any particular uh, proposition, claim positive proposition. And I'll just finish then with this, this long quote. So in no, in no legal system responsive to human needs do citizens, judges, or other officials look to the bare social fact of a past legislative act or act of adjudication, because always the relevance is to such acts in their intrasystemic context. And that context is, first and foremost, a set of propositions identifying necessary and sufficient conditions of validity, both of legislative and adjudicative acts, and of the legal rules identifiable by reference, directly but in part, to those acts. And rightly or wrongly, I've tried to unpack maybe how um, that's directly but only in part, uh, is, can you make your determination by reference to those acts. And such validity conditions pertain not only to the circumstances and form of those acts, but also to the consequent rules' persistence through time 
as members of a set of propositions, the membership of which changes constantly by addition, subtraction, amendment, clarification, explanation, and so forth. And so contributing both rationale and countless details of content to this complex of propositions and intellectual acts will be found references, often silent but detectable by inference, and then to these variety of, you could say, moral concerns. So the desirability of coherence here and now, stability across time as a, as a good, fidelity to undertakings, respect for legitimate expectations, avoidance of tyranny, preservation of the community whose laws these are and its capacity for self-government, protection of the vulnerable, incentives for investment, maintenance of that, conditions of communal life we call the rule of law, and so on, many other evaluative arguments. They are what make sense of and guide the appeal to these posited legal propositions, why we consult them, how we consult them, and therefore I think are as much a part of legal reasoning, judicial reasoning, as these very positive propositions. And in that sense, um, morality is internal to the practice of judicial reasoning. Um, and that, which is a way of answering the, 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 I'll end with the very quote which was at the head of my paper, which was from an Irish court case. Um, and the judge, the judge gave this, you know, passage before he gave his decision. And it's this idea which I'm trying to sort of address this idea that he said if law is to enforce morality then whose morality is it to enforce so this idea that the morality is an external body of rules that you can either adopt bring to the law or not that we should keep out of it because as he says at the end of the day it is the duty of the courts to implement and apply the law and not morality and of course there is a sense in which he's perfectly correct it is only the fact you know it, the ju judge's job is to determine legal claims that's true. It's not to just open-ended moral discussion. And yet, on the other hand, there is a role for morality in how that determination is made, because of both the, why you're making that determination, as I said, to see what is owed to who in the search, situation, and because of the moral orientation of the legal system, the purpose of it, and also in the very way you will refer to those positive rules, why you will refer to them and how you will refer to them, there will be a morality at work. And it's not my morality or his morality or someone else's morality, but I think it is informed by why we have the courts, why we have the law, and that's what I'm trying to speculatively and not very accurately tease out. So thank you for your attention.